Hello, hello. So uh, welcome to welcome to number two of uh, three summer series webinars around the Energy Step Code. Uh, my name is Robin Wark. I'm from BC Hydro. I'm the Vice Chair of the Energy Step Code Council. Uh, so last week we talked about the results from the local government readiness survey that we had uh, and the plans that we have around training capacity building. Today we're going to be talking about best practices for implementing the Energy Step Code for local governments. And then in two weeks' time, we're going to be talking about uh, the preliminary findings of our costing study. Uh, and so if you want to be part of that webinar in two weeks' time, registration is going to be opening this week. Also, a quick plug for our on-demand videos for building officials. So last week, we recorded four training videos for, for building officials telling you everything you need to know or that we can think of that you might need to know um about the energy step code and they're going to be online in the next week or two so we'll let you know about that so next slide please so yeah we're going to welcome you today to um, the webinar around the best practices guide so these are the speakers that we have today we have zachary may from the province of british columbia he's from the building safety standards branch uh, he's the chair of the energy step code council and he's really helped shepherd the regulation to its place in April. Uh, and now, since April, we've been working really hard at trying to take uh, the findings from that, that came, or the advice that we get, got uh, to put that regulation in place into a format that's accessible and useful for the local government. So that's the best practices guide. So Zach's going to be giving a bit of a sneak peek of the best practices guide uh, and uh, talk you through that. So the guide itself will be available later this summer. Um, but hopefully this webinar will give you some of the the key touch points around what the government should be doing if they're thinking about uh, implementing the energy step code. And then we have two great speakers uh, from local government themselves who've had a lot of experience in implementing the energy step code, or sorry, or implementing energy efficiency policies, and they'll be they'll be transitioning over to the energy step code. So it sounds a bit windy there. I don't know if somebody needs to mute. Anyway, I'll carry on, guys. Uh, we have Emily Adden from the city of North Vancouver. Uh, she is the Deputy Director of Community Development uh, for the city of North Vancouver. So she'll be giving a, a view from an urban community around what you can be doing uh, for implementing energy efficiency policies. Uh, Emily also sat through the uh, development of the Energy Step Code uh, as a representative for the Planning Institute of BC, and she's on the Energy Step Code Council going forward. Uh, then we have somebody from a rural community, Andy Christie, from the city of Kimberley. Uh, he's a building official. In fact, he's the chief building official and the entire building department with the city of Kimberley. Uh, it's a small community in the Kootenays. And they too have had experience over a number of years of developing and implementing energy efficiency policy. So he's going to be telling a little bit about uh, the best practices and advice he has for local governments thinking of implementing the code. Okay, next, uh, next slide, please. So yeah, so we're going to be, we have a social media presence. Uh, we have a Twitter account. So if you want to tweet during this webinar or afterwards, feel free to. Uh, some of the key points of the, of the webinar today will be going out uh, on Twitter. And one of the big graphics that we have will be going out both on Twitter and Facebook. So if you have any questions during this webinar, uh, please don't keep them to yourself. Type them into the questions box on the chat on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, I'll be receiving those and then I'll be putting it to the panelists. Uh, at the end of the session, uh, so we have a good time for discussion. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Zach uh, to give us a bit of a, an overview about best practices and what local governments can expect coming forward. Excellent. Thanks yeah. very much, Robin. I'll just wait till I have control of the screen here. There we go. Excellent. So thanks everyone for uh, joining the uh, webinar today. Uh, as Robin mentioned, I work with the Building and Safety Standards Branch and we've been leading the work on uh, developing the technical regulation for the Energy Step Code. Uh, and then as we'll uh, talk about today, working with the Energy Step Code Council and its members uh, to figure out how to roll the step code out, not just as a technical regulation, but as a policy tool for local government uh, on the ground successfully for industry, uh, local government and uh, provincially. I'll be walking through a very high level, uh, my shortest presentation to date, 
uh, on the technical requirements of the step code. This won't be a technical presentation, I promise, but just give a high-level indication of uh, what's new about the energy step code and what that means for builders and local governments on the ground. And then, as Robin suggested, getting into some of the tools and resources available to help local governments make that decision around how they incorporate the energy step code into energy efficiency and gre greenhouse gas emissions reduction policies uh, locally uh, with the resources that we've made available through the Energy Step Code Council. So as mentioned, uh, the province is just a player in a really collaborative approach that we've used uh, to date to develop the energy step code. Uh, and the technical regulation, as well as all the resources that we're talking about today, uh, really are the result of input from uh, local governments, utilities, industry representatives, and others. Uh, and as we roll out the energy step code towards some long-term targets uh, towards 2032, the district transition will rely on this kind of collaborative approach. It's been really successful for us to date, uh, and we're really looking forward to uh, working with our partners as we roll this out going forward. The biggest change with the energy step code in working with the council, the regulation at a very high level is for housing and small buildings, I've got an example here, a roadmap towards our 2032 targets in the province. We're committed to having all new buildings be net zero energy ready, uh, which for our purposes today really is the most efficient buildings you can build by 2032. That's our goal provincially in the BC Building Code. And what we've done in the Energy Step Code is create an incremental roadmap from the BC Building Code today, you can see at the bottom of the screen, towards that 2032 target in a way that local governments can implement locally uh, to improve the level of energy efficiency so that we're ready by 2032, not having to make a huge leap at that point. The Energy Step Code for, uh, here we've got a five-step example for houses and small buildings, is really broken into two key components, um, which is, uh, lower steps. These are, uh, you can see here, equivalent to the BC Building Code today, 10% better and 20% better. These steps, one, two, and three for housing and small buildings, um, and steps one and two for uh, uh, larger, more complex buildings, also called part three buildings in the BC Building Code. These lower steps are certainly where we're going to be focusing the bulk of the efforts in terms of local government programs and initiatives over the next few years. Um, these are uh, steps in the energy step code that can be built with conventional materials and conventional approaches. And many builders are building to the equivalent of these steps on the ground today. The other focus that can't be ignored and is being implemented by some local governments today is the upper steps. These are our long-term targets. If we're looking for a definition of that 2032 goal of net zero energy ready, the higher steps are where we're looking there. And as uh, we'll mention in the best practices guide and a lot of the guidance that uh, uh, is provided through the Energy Step Code Council, we group the steps, not individually, but into groups of lower and upper steps. So that's an important concept to remember as we're going through uh, the guides and timelines for the Energy Step Code. It's also worth being aware that the Energy Step Code is a work in progress. Ideally, uh, certainly by 2032, we need uh, targets for all buildings throughout the province. What we have today is focused on the kinds of buildings that are impacted by local government programs and policies today. And so that's for small residential buildings, three stories and less, we have targets throughout the province for all levels of energy efficiency. And so the energy step code can be implemented in all uh, communities throughout the province for part nine buildings. So that's less than three stories. For those buildings above three stories in building height, large complex buildings, we have targets just for Climate Zone 4, which on this map is identified in that yellow area, Southern Vancouver Island and the Lower Mainland. We do intend to create targets for more building types and more climate zones as time goes on, uh, but certainly the technical work to date resulted in targets for these building types here. So certainly throughout the province, we do have uh, levels of the energy step code that can be implemented for all communities throughout British Columbia. In terms of the most significant change for energy efficiency and the way builders build, the Energy Step Code provides one consistent roadmap that rests on a few key tools and removes one uh, barrier that we have in the building code. This is a shift towards what's called a performance compliance uh, approach in the Energy Step Code that identifies the fact that energy efficiency is complex and to measure the energy efficiency of buildings, we're gonna rely on computer programs through energy modeling. And we're also going to rely on on-site uh, post-construction air tightness tests to see how uh, energy efficient our building envelope is. 
And one of the barriers we've removed in the energy step code is we're providing that flexibility with energy modeling. We're ensuring compliance with that air tightness test. We've removed a lot of the prescriptive requirements in the code for energy efficiency that might have told the builder exactly what insulation they need to put into a building or what doors and windows they need to install. The energy modeling performance approach in the energy step code allows builders to factor in all those decisions themselves and balance them out appropriately in a way that meets their objectives and the objectives of those who are going to occupy those buildings going forward. In terms of our definition of energy efficiency, this is the other objective of the energy step code is to provide a really consistent way of speaking and measuring energy efficiency uh, as we go forward. The energy step code through all levels of energy efficiency provides that clear definition. The first area we focus on is the building envelope. We want to make sure that we have, we're reducing air leakage through the building envelope and really making sure buildings are well insulated and have high performance doors, windows, and skylights. And so all builders are going to be required to just measure the efficiency of their building envelope. This is similar to the approach taken by Passive House and a number of other energy efficiency standards on the market. The other uh, measure that we do in the energy step code is take a look at uh, what's conventionally been used to measure energy efficiency, which is the equipment inside the building. So once we've got a really good envelope and we've reduced the need for complex equipment, we want to still make sure that that heating, hot water, and ventilation equipment inside the house is energy efficient. And lastly, that air tightness test. Post-construction, there's an opportunity to actually measure in a way that's clear and objective, not just an energy model or assumptions in a computer program, but to actually test how good a job everyone involved in construction of the building has done. That gives us an understanding of the energy efficiency, as well as the uh, quality assurance metric for, energy, uh, for the building overall, in a way that a building official is able to objectively measure, as well as the builders and everyone involved in that construction process. A really important learning tool, as well as a code compliance tool. These are the three key elements of how we define energy efficiency in the energy step code, which is going to be really important to understand how we move forward according to these metrics between now and 2032. But the energy step code provides that consistency and guidance. It's also worth noting that we've taken the technical requirements of the energy step code and as of April 7th, 2017, they have been incorporated into the BC building code. What that means for builders is that there are two ways they may find themselves building to the energy step code. Today, they may voluntarily build to a step of the energy step code, and they may be doing so already if they're deciding voluntarily to follow an energy efficiency program, whether that's Energy Star, Built Green, or Passive House, or other programs on the market. They can now use that as a compliance path in the BC building code voluntarily. The other path is uh, that we'll be talking about today and the focus of today's presentation is really on the uh, new ability for local governments to require builders to build to a particular level of the energy step code, which is an authority that we brought in through uh, the Building Act on April 7th as well, that allows local governments to reference particular steps of the energy step code in their community. And how local governments go about doing that successfully is going to be the focus of today's presentation. Uh, and uh, we're going to hear from two local governments that are going through that process about understanding how to incorporate the energy step code in bylaws and policies uh, and other programs at the local government level. In terms of guidelines for implementation, today we are going to be focusing on what's going to be in the upcoming best practices guide at the uh, bottom of the screen here. But that guide is not finalized. For an indication of what's there, and if local governments are looking for clear guidance today from the province, uh, the best guidance available is the provincial policy on local government's implementation of the energy step code. That is a traditional Building Act guide that identifies the new authority that local governments have to require uh, improved energy efficiency with the energy step code at the local government level and what some of the expectations are from a provincial perspective to ensure that that's successful on the ground. What was intended in introducing the energy step code and how local governments can implement that. It's quite basic and really focuses on a provincial regulatory lens, but does provide a clear framework. If you're looking for information today around minimum timelines and expectations for implementing the energy step code, but you will find that this policy guide does point to the uh, forthcoming best practices guide that we'll be talking about today but it's available, this policy guide, on our website, gov.bc.ca slash building codes, or by going to energystepcode.ca. What will be coming out in more detail beyond the provincial policy guide is the best practices guide. This is going to provide really clear guidance for local governments to implement the energy step code and will, goes well beyond 
the policy guide in that it's going to provide examples and has input from local governments on how they can implement the energy step code and input from industry in terms of how to do that successfully to keep industry stakeholders on board as well in improving the energy efficiency of the buildings we build at the local government level. It identifies some really key considerations that local governments need to make in, in terms of what's factored into uh, consultation and what some of the issues at play are with the energy step code and that capacity building that needs to happen. This document, uh, the content is complete and finalized and it's now going through graphic design and final government approvals uh, and we're expecting to have this document published uh, available uh, this summer. But today is that sneak peek on some of that content and what the implications are for local government. The core of this document is what, this, uh, what the process is for implementing the energy step code at the local government level. And the provincial policy guide and uh, what's going to be outlined in the best practices guide is really a five-step process with a whole bunch of details and examples, but at its core, there are five steps. The first step for any local government implementing the energy step code is to review the resources that are available. In the following slides, I'll mention some of those resources that are available in terms of uh, what capacity is like regionally in the province. You can get some indication on some uh, costing studies that we've got coming out and some other resources available. And it's really important that lo local governments attend webinars like this one today and the ones that will be coming out through this summer and this fall um, and really become aware of all the information that's out there. That's the first step. The second step is to mo notify the Energy Step Code Council through the Building and Safety Standards Branch of a local government's intent to reference the Energy Step Code. This is a step that a local government can take prior to making any final decision on what their policy or program might do, but there are minimum timelines uh, outlined in the policy guide and in the best practices guide around uh, how quickly industry can adapt to new changes through policy or bylaw uh, with the energy step code. And so it's really important that local governments indicate to the step code council that they're thinking about referencing particular steps for particular programs so that the step code council can support them and industry in their area in preparing for that transition so that it's successful for everyone. And that starts with notifying the council so that we can be aware of who's thinking of implementing the step code so that we can bring our resources to the table and help support that implementation. The next step, once you've notified the Energy Step Code Council, of course, is to do the work that local governments do in consulting and talking to stakeholders at the local government level within their communities. Uh, to figure out what their approach is going to be, exactly what targets for which buildings and how that's going to play out in terms of the development process, whether that's a base building bylaw or a particular policy for rezoning or some other approach. And defining that approach is certainly the authority of the local government, and that's that process that happens after notification. Once the local government has decided on their process, the Energy Step Code Council would also like to know what that final decision is. When is it going to be enforced? What are the specific parameters around referencing the energy step code? And what kind of buildings does it apply to? This is really important for uh, policy and industry stakeholders to understand how quickly the energy step code is being adopted so that we can work with those provincial partners to make sure that they're prepared uh, to support that transition and provide that feedback to local governments and other industry stakeholders. And the last step, once we've done the notification, consultation, and finalized our plans, is to launch the energy step code in your local government. Um, that's likely what we're going to see rolling out uh, starting this December uh, 2017 and over the uh, coming years. So both governments go through this process at their own pace um, uh, in implementing the energy step code into local government policies and bylaws and others. The notification process, uh, this is very early on in the process and it's uh, really important to be aware this is a formal notification. Um, we've prepared, uh, we've got a draft form of the notification form here. The Building and Safety Standards Branch will be collecting this information. And so you can go to gov.bc.ca or to energystepcode.ca um, to review the uh, notification form that will be ready within the next couple weeks, I assure you. And this is where local governments can fill out but you can see here is a fairly simple form, two pages, to just identify which communities are interested in referencing the energy step code in the future and what kind of buildings it would apply to. This helps to give us a really good understanding regionally and provincially how widely the energy step code is being implemented and at what pace, so we can make sure that everyone's prepared to support that kind of transition. This information ultimately is going to be shared. Uh, the province will process these forms and provide this information in terms of uh, intent to reference the energy step code. 
uh, with the Energy Step Code Council and all of its stakeholders. That includes local governments, but also industry stakeholders who really want to have a clear picture around what kind of capacity they need, they need to build and at what pace. Uh, includes professional organizations, UDI, the Canadian Home Builders Association, and other industry parties. Uh, we're happy to make this information uh, available through the Energy Step Code Council and provide a good regional picture and provincial picture around how the Energy Step Code is being implemented. In terms of resources, that very first step in the process, uh, your one-stop shop uh, that is in development right now, but we expect within the next month or so will be live and fully populated is energystepcode.ca. Visiting that website today, we'll uh, forward you to the Building and Safety Standards Branch website where we are hosting some of the content that'll be on there. But going forward in the months and years to come, the energystepcode.ca will be your one-stop shop for all the resources related to the Energy Step Code. That's where we're gonna be posting the best practices guide that will be available in print and uh, electronic uh, PDF version. This best practices guide is really the core content around how local governments implement the energy step code and what kinds of resources they can get access to to make that consideration at the local government level. The energystepcode.ca website and the Building and Safety Standards Branch website uh, also has, uh, Robin mentioned, uh, technical uh, training videos for building officials and others involved with code compliance, whether they're builders, professionals, or building officials. We have recorded these videos. We're in the final stages of polishing them up and expect to post those on our website and on energystepcode.ca when it's available uh, in the coming weeks. But this is free online training available for anyone who has to enforce uh, or have the Energy Step Code enforced on them uh, in the coming months and years. Another really important resource for local governments is peer learning networks. This is a network uh, that's being supported by uh, BC Hydro and their Sustainable Communities uh, Program. And this is, they're setting up two streams, one for larger local governments and one for smaller local governments to help local governments network their resources and work together collaboratively in a, a more regional way to implement the energy step code and learn lessons from each other in terms of what's been successful, uh, and where we need more resources, and so that they can communicate back to the Energy Step Code Council to make sure that we're doing the kind of resource search and providing the kinds of resources important for local governments. That's all going to be through those peer learning networks. Um, and so stay tuned for more information on those, certainly through the fall. In terms of information, we have uh, taken a really uh, wide approach to uh, working with UBCM. We're uh, we have proposed an event this fall, so stay tuned for a Energy Step Code event at UBCM this year. There was one last year, uh, and we're committed to staying through that formal channel in terms of information, as well as uh, BC Housing and other stakeholders through the Energy Step Code Council are working on an illustrated guide for builders and building officials. The Energy Step Code can be quite complex and technical for some. We're going to create a really clear guide that provides visual examples of what this means for builders and how they can build different to different levels of the Energy Step Code and some of the considerations involved there. Some really good research and work being done there, and that's likely to be released this fall. There are a number of builder seminars and webinars, some that have occurred, but some really great ones coming up this fall as well. Most notably, the Canadian Home Builders of British Columbia are having a Builder Super Week that involves a full day-long training on the Energy Step Code for builders and building officials and others. Um, there's also a number of regional events being hosted by BC Housing, uh, and as well as more formal training being provided through professional associations and industry associations, whether that's uh, window manufacturers or the architects or uh, uh, association of professional engineers and geoscientists in BC are all planning formal training events to identify what the energy step code means for their members and prepare their membership. And the energy step code council is supporting all of this work to make sure that everyone is prepared for this transition. Is that just uh, 30 more seconds if that's good? Excellent. The, uh, the last piece, I believe this is actually my last slide, is uh, the costing study. Uh, another key piece of information, some really uh, great research is being done here to identify what the energy step code means for builders and what this is actually going to cost for builders, homeowners, and others, what kind of savings we're going to see, and what this means for different building types. This information is being finalized this fall and will inform those builder guides and all of the information that comes out this fall as well. Uh, so some really key information for local governments as they implement the energy step code locally. With that, I will uh, pass it back to Robin. Thank you, everyone. Great stuff, Zach. Thanks a lot.
Okay, so let's uh, head over to Emily from the city of North Vancouver, and she's uh, going old school here with the, the phone. Uh, uh, yeah. She's got the, the, the best volume. <laughs> Better so volume, I'm, so I'm, I'm going low tech. <laughs> over to you. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, so I, I was sitting here, I was laughing a couple of times. I don't know if you saw me uh, waving my hands above my head, but I've been in this office for, for well over a year, and it's the first time my lights have gone out. I guess I move around quite a bit usually, so we might need to study the um, long-term health impacts of webinars, participating in webinars. But uh, uh, I seem to have been sitting on my duff for quite a bit. Uh, so I'll, I'll add my thanks to Zach's um, and Robin's and thanking you guys for uh, participating in today's webinar. I'm pleased to share my own thoughts about um, what our city's history has been in working on grappling with the step code and also previously in support of energy efficient buildings. So we have some history there that, that we can share. And what I'm going to, uh, oh, I don't have control yet, I don't think. Routine? Aha. You have control. No, I don't have it yet. Maybe move the slide forward then for me. Okay, great. Uh, so this is what I'll be covering off for you guys today. I'll just give you a very, very brief background on the city of North Vancouver. I'm not sure where you're from in the province, so I'll just say a few words. Um, and then speak a little bit about the history of energy efficient buildings initiative at the city of North Vancouver in the context of other work that we've done on energy. Uh, and um, share a few thoughts with you based on our own experience on how to determine what steps to use and how to use them uh, and talk about uh, the stakeholder advice that we've received in past and and how it relates to the work we're doing now and transitioning to the step code um, a few thoughts on how to get your own organization ready for implementation and also a few thoughts on our own journey to transitioning to the step code uh, from our current requirements Oh, I still don't have it. So maybe forward me. Uh, okay, great. So we're a small city, uh, just seven square kilometers. So with a quite a small population as well. We're on the north shore of the Bird Inlet. Uh, we have um, the Bird Inlet to the south of us. Oh, I think I have control now. Here we go. Bird Inlet to the south of us, um, as well as suburban development and um, the mountains to the north of us. So that's our context. We have good bones, um, tight grid laid out for streetcar and walkability, and uh, we're 85% multifamily, so that's a very urban context. Oh, back up. Uh, so, in terms of the history of energy efficiency uh, for buildings at the City of North Vancouver, it's a long and storied history. Uh, we've been working to mitigate uh, energy use and um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions for, for quite some time. And I'll share with you uh, a, this timeline that looks back um, some years, and I'll mention only a few steps along the way. In 2002, our official community plan, so not the one that we've just completed recently, but uh, the 2002 version, it was drafted as an award-winning um, integrated community sustainability plan. So on the strength of that, we were able to do quite a few things after that. In 2004, uh, we started up a city-owned and now city-wide district energy utility. In 2011, um, we uh, kicked off the Energy Efficient Buildings Initiative. There was a couple of years of work uh, to get to that point, but in January 1st, 2011, uh, what we had done actually, and you may have heard of it, is that in essence, we took um, density away for virtually all uses for every part of the city. And in exchange, with the other hand, we gave it back, um, and then in some cases with some additional density, and, and took away some antiquated aspects of the zoning bylaw at the same time in order to incur um, some mutual benefit. And um, in return for all of that, uh, taking away and giving back, we, uh, we required higher energy efficiency for all of those buildings. 
Um, in 2014, we, we passed a green building zoning bylaw that uh, allows zoning exclusions for height and setbacks and floor area in to order to encourage green building construction. And in 2016, we did a neighborhood-wide rezoning of a neighborhood known as Moodyville, and I'll speak about that more as well in a moment. Uh, so taking a step back and looking back in time to the work that we did um, leading up to those changes in 2011 and also our work more recently, uh, what we did uh, back in 2009 actually um, in lead up to those changes is that we put together uh, energy efficient buildings working group and those were representatives from industry so we had developers there we had a representative from the Architectural Institute of BC APEG BC each of our advisory bodies to council um, a number of subject matter experts and uh, and also representatives of internal staff groups um, it was hugely successful. Um, my only regret is uh, we needed a better acronym than uh, EEBWG, and I would strongly suggest looking for something better if you if you went that way. Uh, and we got really great advice from that group, and we got buy-in um, from such a range of different interests uh, in the city. So it was very, very successful. In terms of studies and data leading up to those big changes that I spoke of in 2011, we don't have a lot of resources ourselves. We begged and borrowed from many um, and looked at a lot of studies that had been done by others, not by ourselves. Um, and especially we leaned on the city of Vancouver who were very generous with us um, and BC Hydro as well. We got quite a lot of support there. In terms of consultation with industry, beyond um, the Energy Efficient Buildings Working Group, again, we are mainly piggybacking on the consultation um, done by City of Vancouver with the Urban Development Institute. And then we added on to that, we layered onto it our own smaller consultation efforts. Uh, we went to council early and often. It's very important to have that. Uh, we had a, a policy workshop um, with council um, that got to really get into things more deeply and, and chew everything up a bit and, and look at it from all sides. So that was very useful. Uh, and also in terms of our communications with the public and council, we, we made sure to tear things up into bite-sized pieces. And uh, we found that was uh, quite successful as well. In terms of consultation with neighboring jurisdictions, um, uh, that's probably more of a recent phenomenon. We've been in quite a lot of discussions with Metro Vancouver municipalities through the Regional Planning Advisory Committee uh, and also uh, more sub-regionally, uh, North Shore municipalities have gotten together and we're, we've met to discuss aligning our requirements across the sub-region. So no commitments yet made, but, uh, but that effort is certainly there. Emily, two uh, minutes left. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, key guidance from stakeholders, uh, we, we were uh, strongly advised to use established performance st standards, so uh, EnerGuide, for example, for the Energy Efficient Buildings Initiative, and now the STEP code creates that uh, consistency as well, and we need to look no further. Uh, in terms of... Um, the comment I want to make about feasibility, not pre preference, uh, we wouldn't have gotten very far on life safety issues if we let developers tell us how quickly they wanted to move. In every instance, we have to find the um, mutual benefit and find what's feasible, um, but also work together and with these, um, with these stakeholders to move the mountain. In terms of putting our money where the mouth is, there was a developer who was very um, involved on the energy efficiency Buildings Working Group, who is actually suggesting for our municipality a 1% performance bond, and we've been collecting that um, consistently since um, 2011. Um, we take it uh, uh, at building permit, and we give it back after verification and compliance, and we'll continue to do that with the STEP code. Uh, in terms of finding mutual benefit, I talked about replacing antiquated zoning requirements when we were putting in place energy-efficient buildings initiatives. We did the same sort of thing with Moody 
Libreville where we were doubling or tripling the density and also pre-zoning the area um, and in return requiring the equivalent of the highest steps of the step code. And then uh, I won't go very much into discussions with stakeholders on district energy connection. I would say the jury's still out and we're still in the midst of quite a lot of discussions uh, with our city-owned utility developers and designers about what the right approach is. I was um, mentioning... Anyway, we could just wrap it up. That would be great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, well, I'll skip uh, ahead. Uh, to talk about how we've gotten our organization ready. Oh, uh, we found uh, a partner. Uh, well, actually, if I'm wrapping it up, I'll just leave it there. And if anyone has any questions, I can speak to um, how you could get your organization ready and then also uh, how, uh, how we're moving ahead with uh, transitioning to the new step code. That's great. Thanks a lot. And, uh, and let's turn it over to Andy. Andy, maybe you can focus on those questions about getting that organization ready. And I know your organization is a little bit different in size from Emily's, but uh, let, let's focus wait. on those principles. You, you give us an overview. I'll have to wait for my slides. Oh, wow. Oh, there you go. That looks like I have control. Maybe someone can forward it. Sure. Yeah, basically the same overview of presentation. Um, we could probably skip to the next slide and I'll get right to it to keep on schedule here. Uh, yeah, Kimberley's in a different zone and very different size than North Vancouver. We're in a much colder region in the southeastern BC in the, in the Kootenays. Um, being that, we're a much energy minded community just because the cost of energy cost of heating is very expensive for some of the leaky homes here. It's a smaller population, only just over 7,000. Um, the population is really starting to grow though since the last census. And we're also on our target of 33% uh, emission reduction. We're at 27% currently. Uh, we've done quite a bit of changes just how the city operates and also with the incentive programs, just how the town and the city op operates. So. Still not seeing the. Oh. Uh, we started a program in 2014 just based on the Energuide rating system, the old Energuide rating system, the numerical system, and reflected it with just a percentage of building permit rebate. And we also had a renovation stream for some of the houses here that actually a lot of houses didn't have insulation in them at all. They were built during the mining boom here back in the 30s and 40s. So a lot of renovations have been happening, people are actually adding insulation and getting rid of single pane windows. Uh, we transitioned to the step code, which was easy to transition to just based on the steps and the percentages over building code values. Basically, we based that on the rebate amount of the building permit they get back now. We also offered a $500 off the get-go rebate just to encourage people to use an energy advisor. Uh, we tried mandating this in new zoning and we got a lot of pushback from the developers just because of the smaller amount of houses that are built here. Um, and we thought if we mandate it, we're going to reduce the developers are just going to go elsewhere to another community that doesn't have a restriction. They look at it more as a restriction than a benefit. But I have had a lot of those builders change their mind now and taking advantage of the incentive program, basically because we're giving the money. Um, but mandating it would probably be down the road. We're considering it now that council has an appetite with the incentive program. Um, the step code was an easy metric to apply to town. Uh, we're working with the Community Energy Association, a region-wide program to include all of the East Kootenays and West Kootenays in the future. Only a few communities, uh, I think Invermeer and Spirewood, have currently have incentive programs. And it seems to work incentive-based around here, just based on the number of homes that are built and the appetite with the developers and builders. We're also in consultation with a lot of the real estate brokers around town, just because houses that are selling uh, currently, there's two at the bottom. This one's net zero, pretty close to net zero. There's no category for that, but it, it's not officially a net zero home. It's got solar panels all around it, hot water, solar, uh, double wall. And then the house on the right is a new passive house that's being built right now. It just got its floor door test done at insulation stage and has met passive house standard for air tightness at 0.05 air changes. 
Um, it seems to be more than not the houses that are built in this community are higher end and they demand a higher energy value. Um, advice again, sort of matching the bigger municipalities. Just it's it's a little bit quicker and easier. The bureaucracy in a smaller city is the same levels, just not as broad. So it's easier to go through the levels of bureaucracy. Um, just because I'm pretty much the only one having to deal with the levels of bureaucracy. The counselors come into my office. The builders come into my office. I know all the builders. So it's it's a little tighter knit. It's quite easy to get programs like this in your smaller communities. Uh, so it's not really a detriment. You should promote the use of the building systems. I've had more people come to me about passive house and built green and net zero wanting to build that way. Um, so the incentive program works for them quite well. They're usually surprised that they get money to do that because they were doing it anyway. Um, I had a local developer who was on the built green board and he actually wanted the initial rebate program just because he was always building his houses to build green and then he wanted me to mandate that all houses be built to build green. And it seemed a little too restrictive to pick one building scheme over another, but to welcome all of them on an even par is kind of how we adopted it. Um, I find the incentives to use an energy advisor at the permit stage are a really good carrot at the end of the stick to get those builders and developers who are kind of thinking of doing it and kind of thinking of implementing it, but are not quite there. And also to have the energy advisor engage with them and offer to open up, say, uh, an active test that's ongoing. Because seeing it is truly believing when they come in and see the energy evaluation program in place and they see the blower door test working. Um, I've had a lot of builders who are basically not believing in that, you know, hocus pocus and all that kind of stuff. That changes their mind when they see the, you know, with a smoke pencil, they get to walk around and find air leakage in the house. So definitely changes their mind about how it all works. Um, what we're finding here is to be clear about what type of reporting you want from your energy advisor. There's two different types of streams of reporting. There's the ERS, which is the Enter Guide reporting, and there's also the 936 Compliance Pathway reports. They are similar, but they're different. Um, and also inspections are required if you get an ERS report or they're not required for insulation and vapor barrier if you get a 936 report. Um, just to be very clear that if you accept both or one or above the other. And then also talk to your local suppliers because bringing in these products that improve insulation value, air sealing, um, triple pane windows, they're not actually, you know, just make sure they can supply the demand and that the other homeowners that are not maybe taking advantage of your incentives, they might, you know, want to use those products as well. Two, two more minutes, please, Andy. All right, I'm speeding along here. If I could forward us. Oh. Basically, how we got our city ready, um, working with the planning department, they helped me create an application and a guide, which was helpful to hand out tangible to anyone interested in the program. We also put it on our websites and Facebook, got it out to the community. There was a couple of local meetings with all the builders. Uh, there was limited training for changing, you know, building permits are issued the same way. The finance department has to give back some money now. They do that at the application stage before they pay for their permit. So it's a little easier to track. Uh, the inspection process doesn't really change at our end unless there's an energy report. Um, so the number three, training with front counter staff is pretty benign. Training for the builders was a big one, but uh, once they got run through on energy evaluation the first time, they're hooked. Um, I have builders that I'm going to build every house now regardless of, you know, they're just going to mandate it in their building. Uh, reporting back to council, it's good and bad for me just because I'm taking away my own revenue by giving it back. Um, I supplement it with other sources of funding. Basically the small pie chart there on the side is I'm, I do all those jobs pretty much everything in the whole department. So it's good and bad as well. Um, yeah. Two more minutes. Transitioning, we have cons consultation with other communities as we have a local building inspector meeting and we talk about it with other communities. The previous incentive program was a, it was a wash to go to the step code because we already had success with the previous program that they bought in. Adding the $500 carrot to get the energy advisor on board was definitely a boost this year. We have over Close to 90% of all new homes being built to some level of the step code. Most of them on average are around the 40% over code, which is surprising to me even. Uh, and we funded through just care funding and other sources. We have a climate action fund that we pay into voluntarily. 
as well. So we kind of stream the money through the general revenue back from the CARE funding. And then definitely I have more cons consultation with council than I want sometimes, um, but they seem to have quite an appetite for the incentive program. Not necessarily the zoning changes and the bylaw changes at this point, although they are starting to come around to it with the Building Act and other discussions. It seems to be on the end of their tongue a little bit more, and that poss possibly is going to change in the future. Think Great stuff. Probably is it. Good stuff. Okay. Over to thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone, for some great presentations here. I've got a number of questions that we'll uh, we'll roll through here. So let's start it off with this one. What's the difference? And and maybe Zach or um, Andy, this one's to you. What's the difference between the BC Energy Step Code and passive house or built green type programs? Is the Step Code the target, and the other tools the way to get there? That's from Josh at Prince George. I'll defer that to Zach. <laughs> sure, it's a it's a great question, and I think actually the question gives the best answer. Um, the uh, energy step code is the regulation, so those are the targets that shall be hit if you're going to satisfy the requirements of the building code or what the local government is asking for. The programs like Passive House, Built Green, Energy Star, R2000, all those other green building programs that exist out there. Uh, are great support tools to help builders understand how to meet those targets that are in the energy step code. It is worth noting though, with the exception of Passive House, uh, these green building programs, satisfying their, uh, their requirements does not mean that you've automatically satisfied the requirements of the step code. So building to Energy Star doesn't guarantee compliance with the step code, but it probably ends up around step three, 90% of the time. So a close relationship, but not identical. So the programs are great support tools uh, for voluntary use by builders. So, okay, a question maybe again to Zach or you know Andy, jump in if you want to. Uh, Neil from Port Coquitlam says, how much uh, will it cost a builder to retain an energy advisor for an average single family home build? Um, we offer the $500 just because there's three energy advisors in our area. They have varying rates depending on their travel time. We actually have one now situated in Kimberley, so the cost has come down. I think they get a benefit to using him just because he doesn't have the travel time, and I think the $500 more than covers the initial report and the final report and the blower door test, which is pretty good value for 500 bucks. Yeah, certainly we've done, uh, yeah, we've done an informal survey of uh, a handful of energy advisors around the province, and uh, their fees all seem to start in the neighborhood of five or $600. Uh, going up depending on how many services you use, but certainly they're seeing that the energy step code, because it puts compliance all in one regulation, uh, makes it pretty efficient. So it's uh, for a basic house, if you've got all your information in order, uh, $600 is uh, certainly what I've been hearing. Okay, good stuff. Here's another question. Um, and again, anybody can take this one. What incentive is there for any developer or building owner to go beyond the minimum requirements of the BC building codes? in terms of energy and energy cost performance when the baseline reference building is improving all the time? Zach, maybe that's for you. Uh, one incentive that we now have in the energy step code and in the climate leadership plan is that by 2032, you're gonna have to build to the highest steps. We need to if we're gonna uh, achieve our climate targets. Uh, so that's a really clear signal that we haven't had in the past. The value of learning now is that you can do so with incentive programs and support or builders can wait until 2032 and have to do so just by regulation. Um, and so there's a real advantage to being able to try and learn now in a more uh, supportive environment. Uh, I think there's a big advantage to builders building that capacity now early uh, and then not having to worry about that code change 15 years from now. I'll add something as well. Uh, what we found when we required Energuide 80 as a minimum for single family homes is that once they had uh, looked at design work differently and retained a certified energy advisor, a lot of builders were finding that they could easily surpass that minimum. So since we're moving to verification and compliance for all buildings, for all types, uh, soon in the building code, we can expect that um, that all builders will be more incentivized to see where it's easy to surpass the bare minimum. And uh, in fact, we, what we saw in our city is that it, it became part of the marketing um, for sale of these homes. Good stuff. Here's another question, um, maybe Zach or anybody else. 
After December, will all new residential development require a blow door test and an energy assessment? The short answer is no. Uh, if builders are using the energy step code, they have to use energy modeling and they have to do a blower door test. But the prescriptive requirements that are in the code today uh, don't disappear on December 15th. The only change on December 15th is that local governments uh, may have bylaws that in certain situations or certain parts of their community may require building to the energy step code. But it's only energy step code buildings that would need to have that lower door test uh, and use the energy advisor. But all sorts of reasons why builders may want to voluntarily do that. Okay, thanks. There's another question from Michelle from the city of Kelowna. She says, in Kelowna, we issue over 600 single family developments in average annually. Uh, for step one, we would need the service of, of certified energy advisors. We have one so far in our area without creating delays in building permit turnaround. How is the province responding to this challenge? Uh, this issue around capacity in the industry was raised uh, early and often by local governments and industry representatives through the Energy Step Code Council. We've done a survey of energy advisors and capacity in the industry, um, and so we've got an understanding of how many energy advisors are out there, where they are regionally in the province, um, and how long it would take to build up capacity. And so if your community is interested in tackling that question, uh, by all means, reach out to the Energy Step Code Council and we can help provide you with the information to understand how quickly uh, your builder community could adapt to the capacity that is there and how to support the energy advisors in waiting uh, in your community in getting trained and ready to support that kind of change. I'd like to add something as well. For a building bylaw or a zoning bylaw, a zoning amendment bylaw, you can actually have an adoption date and then six months later or or twelve months later the enactment date. And if you if the entire community knows it's coming, those certified energy advisors will come. They will um, train and or move to the area and, and you will see that uptake in certified energy advisors. We certainly did in the city of North Vancouver. Andy, any comments from you around energy advisor capacity and if that's been an, an issue in your community? Uh, no, we actually had too many before with not enough work and now they seem to be all pretty content with the incentive programs that are popping up. Um, and with what is coming down with the step code, I think they're anticipating more work coming, and so that they're, they're probably just going to focus more on energy advisor and some of their less their part-time jobs. Okay. So a couple of questions here for Emily. The first one is, can we hear a bit more from Emily on how local government can get ready to implement the energy step code? Uh, so I think I'm interested in that latter part of your presentation. And then Emily, uh, is the city of North Van working with realtors to help make energy efficiency part of the marketing for the sale of homes? I, I missed the, la the second question. Working with who? Realtors. Oh, realtors. Okay. Uh, the short answer for the second question is no, not in, not in any capacity beyond um, having open houses and, and forums um, on these kinds of issues and, they, and them being, um, of course, welcome to attend and ask questions. But in terms of the work that we have done for the Energy Efficient Buildings in Initiative to get ready for implementation, um, it was working very closely with the building division. In fact, I, I, hope, and I hope in retrospect we could have done better with that. Uh, so, so I think having that connectivity between the work of the planning group and the, and the building uh, group is absolutely essential for success. Um, training for the permits um, and inspections teams is really important just for them to understand, not to do all the work of the certified energy advisors. Um, training for front counter staff. Um, one thing to not forget is that often it's the development planning staff that are the first point of contact for developers, so even if they are, even if it's a building bylaw, uh, to give um, the the industry really early notice about what will be required or what's coming down the pike is highly appreciated, and you'll you'll really decrease the amount of um, complaints you could possibly have if if you take that approach. Uh, and then I would just say keeping all interested parties in addition to industry stakeholders in the loop really helps um, to keep everyone on board on, on the larger uh, goals of, of the program. Cool. 
Here's a, another question to you, Emily, I think, as the representative from the Planning Institute uh, on the Energy Set Code Council. Here's from Teresa from the Township of Langley. She says, is adoption required by a policy or bylaw at the local government level? Does either carry equal authority? I missed the last part. Sorry, I'm having oh. a hard time here. So, okay. is so let me try again. Is adoption okay. required via policy or bylaw at the local government level? Does either carry equal authority? Uh, well, that's a good question. I guess if we went back to what I was going to talk about in terms of where we're going with our transition, um, we already had one requirement in bylaw form, so that was the minimum, and then we also had a rezoning policy, so similar to uh, City of Vancouver and many other places, such that if you're actually seeking an uplift in density, then you're expected to do more. So, uh, for example, you could have for um, uh, single family homes, you could have a requirement for step two of the step code uh, for all buildings, whether or not they're seeking any kind of increase in density, and then you could have a zoning bylaw, oh, sorry, a zoning policy uh, that sets out an expectation that if you're seeking some kind of additional density that you would build to step three and then you would find a way to lock that in. It might be through a covenant registered to title, it could be through CD zoning, um, but I would say, depending on the um, organizational culture, um, uh, then it would really depend on the situation. It doesn't always have to be locked in by bylaw. It can sometimes be locked in or, or, or set out in policy form and then locked in by covenant. Yes, sir. Sounds like the type of question that will be uh, well discussed at the peer network when we've got them in place so to work out what the most effective tools are. Uh, here, Zach, here's one for you. Is there any discussion of developing a version of the energy set code that addresses existing buildings? Uh, yes, <laughs> um, but that is a really challenging puzzle. Um, federally, there's a commitment to have a code for existing buildings that would tackle energy efficiency in place by 2022. I think that's a amazingly ambitious timeline, uh, but provincially we're working on that and uh, we're certainly taking a look at what options might be available to us provincially to uh, take action in existing buildings. But today, the energy step code is really intended for new buildings. Existing buildings are much more complicated, not just on energy, but generally they're a, a really challenging piece. Um, and so we are, uh, stay tuned for any action on that, but nothing today. Good stuff. Here's a, a question um, about the uh, service quality of energy advisors. Uh, maybe a question for you, uh, Zach. What professional qualifications, of any, does the energy advisor need to have? Uh, are they required to have a registered professional engineer to sign off on the work that's completed? Uh, it really depends on the project and the approach they're taking. If a builder is building to one of the targets that go through the Energuide rating system, then the Energuide rating system, administered by Natural Resources Canada, does require energy advisors to be registered and in good standing with Natural Resources Canada. If a builder is taking an approach to use an architect or engineer, um, then they've got professional services and uh, they go down that route. But the Energy Step Code leaves all of those options available. Uh, equally, builders could build uh, with an energy advisor not registered with Natural Resources Canada, but they do need to know how to use the uh, tools required by the Energy Step Code. So it's certainly easiest to use the most qualified persons, uh, but they don't have to be uh, registered professionals in terms of architects or engineers. They can be energy advisors and that's probably most easily done most commonly with someone um, uh, registered with Natural Resources Canada in most cases. Good stuff. Well thanks very much to everyone for all the questions that came in. We didn't get to quite all of them but we had some great discussion here. Uh, thanks to Emily and Zach and Andy for all your insights. Uh, we will be doing a survey following this webinar so please send us your, your input. Uh, on how we can continue to get good information out to everyone. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for participating. Have an excellent rest of, the, uh, rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone. Great, thanks.